Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. Welcome to Catholic Mysticism, where Al Velosky talks about the supernatural aspects of our faith, the saints, and other related subjects. And now here he is, Al Velosky. Hello, Bob. How are you? I'm doing good. Good Good. to have you with us. Good. Glad glad you're doing well. Well, tonight... So what... Yes, go ahead. I thought I was going to ask you, where are we going tonight? We're going to talk about a question I think is kind of relevant, uh, although some people may not think it is. And that's a question that certainly children ask and adults do, because I've run into this question myself, and it's a very interesting discussion, on will we see our pets and will animals be in heaven? And I want to start the program off by saying that these are uh, some of the stuff I will talk about tonight. There'll be some scripture um, verses that will back it up, and a lot will be common sense toward our Lord, but being childlike, because the church has never traditionally um, formed a, a, an opinion whether animals will be in heaven. They're kind of silent about it, and a lot of other uh, uh, faith denominations also are. But it still is a question that's asked by many, many people do because they love animals, especially children when they lose their pets. And we're going to talk about that. So again, I'm just going to give a a little heads up that this will be a lot of uh, opinion. Uh, It'll be some scripture verses on the Bible, certainly and some of the saints in heaven. But again, it, this is not an official, anything we'll be talking about tonight outside of what we know the church teaches. It, it, the church has not made a definitive uh, statement on that. So with that in mind, let us begin. Because our Catholic faith and Christianity is built on a single premise of what that faith is. And that premise is that a man who was tortured and crucified in three days rose from the dead. That is the the belief of our faith. That is what makes our faith relevant and real and worthwhile. Now, St. Paul in Scripture talks about this. He says, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not happen, there's no purpose in what we do. It makes no sense at all. It's useless and worthless. So in essence, if there is no afterlife, if Christ did not rise from the dead, if there is no eternal reward, nor an eternal punishment, then for all intents and purposes, we should probably do just what our base instincts tell us to do. Eat, drink, be merry, live the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest, to get ahead, stop at nothing, and break all the commandments that we know of and the good that we are supposed to do. Because if we are annihilated at the end of our lives, complete annihilation, not seeing our loved ones anymore, not seeing God, not the saints, all a fairy tale, all a myth, and we are annihilated also, then you probably should live this life at 300 miles an hour, and do, in essence, what a lot of these secular um, precepts that bring people happiness, you should do. But what separates us is that Resurrection Sunday. Because that is the victory over death. That, as St. Paul says, when we get on the other side in a twinkling of an eye, we die, It's like a blink of the eye, and boom, we're on the other side. So in essence, life is not ended, but it is changed. It is the beginning of a new journey. A journey in heaven with Christ is what we hope and pray for. So we believe in this resurrection. And how incredible when we think about that, that this is. 
that God became man in the incarnation for love of us to make what went wrong in the Garden of Eden so that we could defeat death and sin and live forever. And we really, let's be quite honest, none of us here on earth in our, our humanity can really wrap, wrap this around our, our minds and our brains. You know, it's so hard for us to grasp that. Yes, we hear it. Yes, we believe it. But to really comprehend that, some of the saints have, but to really grasp that is hard for the average man and woman. And we have to accept it on faith. But it's truly stupendous when you think about this. It's an incredible miracle. You know, God told his apostles that this would happen. He would die in three days. He would rise from the dead. So here's the first miracle that we have that was announced prior to its coming. And you know, the second one we have is the Virgin uh, Mary and Fatima predicting the miracle of sun in October 13, 1917. So these things happen. And why I want to point out, we believe in that miraculous. We believe in the unbelievable. We step out in faith. And when everything screams at us, when scientists and theologians and when the brilliant minds and the thinkers and the think tanks tell us it can't be, it can't be, it can't be, it can't be this, it can't be that. We step out in faith and we leap out in faith and we know deep in our core, deep in our soul, that it is true what we believe. We don't need anyone to tell us that because we deep, deep, deep in our core believe in that miracle of resurrection. And this is our leap of faith. And so this is what we believe, and we will believe we will be, Lord willing, with him in the end. So we have to trust in our miracles. We have to believe in that unbelievable. We have to believe in the supernatural, that there is something above us, something we can't control, something so far removed from our reality that we can never grasp it, that we will never have a mathematical equation, that all the science and logic in the world will not get us there. And we have to let that go. And as Christ said in Scripture, be childlike. And that's what we need to do when we have our picture of heaven. We need to be more childlike. We need to have that innocence that a child has. We need to grasp that innocence. We need to hold on to that innocence, especially when our adult minds advance, especially in today's age with so much technology and uh, so many things we have, to go and step back outside of ourselves and to be like little children at one time we wore. You know, to quote Anthony Stefano in his uh, brilliant book, Travel Guide to Heaven, he speaks of theologians. And he said that, you know, they're like brilliant, brilliant mathematicians that have all the formulas of all the equations and all the calculus and then miss the simple arithmetic right in front. And that's something we want to be careful of not doing. You know, once while I was uh, uh, working with the environmental protection, uh, they had a guy come in that was an animal uh, uh, rehabilitator. He had a, a zoo up in Massachusetts, a brilliant young man. He was like 45 or so. And had, had done some, uh, quite a bit of work all over the world. As a matter of fact, he was one of the few people that was allowed to take care of an Asian crocodile, which are really, really rare. And he had some great experiences. It was great talking to him. Reminded me a little of uh, Steve Irwin, or the crocodile hunter. And I'll never forget when he began his talk, it was kind of funny because he said, you know what a PhD is, he said, everyone? He said, it means that you've lost your common sense 99% of the time. And I, he got a chuckle out of that, and I'm not getting on anybody that's educated or has a PhD. But what he was trying to bring a point 
was despite all the science and despite all the information we have, that sometimes you can miss the big picture which is right in front of your face and the simple things in nature and in God's creation. This gentleman was a Christian, by the way. Um, and he had a very strong and a very good case he built against evolution. So it was a fascinating talk. But anyway, nonetheless, what I'm getting at now is that, so when we're talking about this, that's what we need to be is open tonight. Because most of us believe that if we get to heaven, we're going to see God, certainly. We're going to see the saints. We're going to see our loved ones. And that will go on and on forever. No more separation. And that's a very, very valid belief that goes with what we were saying at the beginning of the program to the resurrection because that's our faith. And that's our goal. That's what this is about. That's what the church is. The church's mission, number one, is the salvation of souls. Because in the end we die, but then we live somewhere else. And we want to be that place where God is. And that's heaven. Because where God isn't is hell. So that's the end game, so to speak. Now, the question that we're going to pose tonight, and this is a question that I think if you've been a parent and your little child has lost a dog or a cat or whatever it is, a parakeet, any animal, or you yourself, let's say just in the last couple of weeks, one of your beloved pets is gone and you miss and this brings us to the question, is it, is it wrong to grieve for pets? Because we know that human beings are created in what we call the Mago Dei, created in God's image. So we're special. We are. We're set aside from the animal kingdom. Okay? We can't compare animals to people. We cannot. You know, there, there's a little false you know, realism in today's world where you see starving people all over the world, and this is so traffic, tra uh, tragic, excuse me. and yet you see not a lot of help sometimes being given those starving people, but if there's an orphan animal, like I remember reading once where there were two mountain lion cubs that were found, I think it was in California, and thousands and thousands of dollars came in to take care of those two cubs, and yet there's people still starving. So that's, it's misplaced is what I'm trying to say. We've got to be careful of that. Because when God created, um, cre the, he's, he created creatures, and he created the animals, and all of creation, and the trees, and the birds, and the plants, and the seeds, he said it was good. But when he created Adam and Eve, he said it was very good. And as again, as I mentioned, we were created in his image. Now, Adam and Eve had a special relationship with the animal kingdom. And it was. They did have a relationship. They were supposed to be good stewards of all of God's playground, Eden. And that included the animals. But Adam and Eve had a special relationship being created in the image of God with each other. Especially Eve being taken from the rib of Adam. So while they had a special relationship with the animals, they had a special relationship with each other. And that's important to remember because there's nothing wrong with us loving animals, taking care of animals, we're supposed to, and grieving for them when they die. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you're thinking we're shortchanging anything by grieving for animals, that's a mistake. We're not. But we also can't put them above us. That's where we want to keep, you know, a good balance, a, a good logical balance there. So when we go back to creation now, we see that all is good and man and woman, very good. And God is pleased in his work. But as we know, sin comes into the world and there's a disconnect and a fracture from God. We want to be God. That hasn't changed to this very moment as we speak tonight. And all of creation, here's the key, all of creation is affected by this. In Genesis we are told that not only man and woman will eat the seeds and the fruit, but so will the animals. But once Satan has tricked Adam and Eve, there's a break now. 
And that disconnect just doesn't affect Adam and Eve and in turn all human beings, but the animal kingdom itself. And then, you know, you have during the time of the flood, when mankind is so bad, so sinful, that God is angry what he did and wants to destroy the world. And he makes a covenant with Noah. We know the story of the flood and how two of every kind are taken on the ark. And when he makes that covenant in Genesis, he tells Noah, it's not just for Noah and his family, but for all the creatures too. So God is signifying here, he made these animals. They are affected by man's sin. And he also tells Noah, because that man will continue his evil ways, and this is so sad, that we're going to be able to eat meat now. So we were able to kill them. Animals were used for man's use. And that law of the jungle kicks into full force. But God loves his creation so much that he did make that covenant to restore. So here we see a little pattern of Genesis where we see creation, destruction, and then we will see recreation with Noah over a period of time. And then at the end of time, as we know, we will have a new heaven and a new earth. And things, including the animals, will be restored. St. Paul talks about this in Scripture in Romans, that all of creation, all of creation, groans and travail, awaiting its Savior. So, in Scripture, too, we see that the animals play a special part. We see them at our beloved Lord's birth, where they're rejected by men. And Mary and Joseph have their child in a stable. And there are animals to witness this. How the shepherds, tending their flocks, their flocks of sheep, the lowest people here in society, the discarded, the shepherds, but because of tending their flocks of sheep, the multitude of angels tell them the good news. And we see that Mary riding to Bethlehem to have her child is on a donkey. Christ will make, as we come close now to Palm Sunday, we know that he enters to the Hosannas in the highest on a donkey. So God has used animals throughout Scripture. You know, remember the story of Balaam, where he was supposed to curse Israel, and yet he, as he was riding on that talking donkey, that donkey straightened him out, and Israel ended up getting a blessing, which infuriated the king that wanted a curse put on them that contacted Balaam to do it. So if we look at Scripture, we can see that God has a special affinity for animals, and they're used quite a bit to bring about his plan of salvation to all. You know, in uh, St. Mark, remember at the end, what Jesus commissions the apostle, go and tell every living creature about the good news. Now, Notice it's not just human beings. He did, Jesus didn't just say, go out and tell all human beings. He said all creatures. And that's important to remember. So we see, we see this pattern, we throughout Scripture. And, you know, a couple things. One of the things, um, the famous story of uh, St. Francis, if you recall, when he was challenged by a Jewish merchant in the town no, no, excuse me, that's St. Anthony. I said St. Francis, excuse me. When he was challenged by the Jewish merchant in the town on the real presence of the Eucharist, he was called right out as he was walking in town. And that merchant made uh, a plan that he would embarrass St. Anthony by starving his donkey three days and then St. Anthony could come and proceed with the Eucharist, and he challenged to see who, where that burrow would go. Would he go to the oats and hay 
that the merchant would put out or would he go to the Eucharist? And St. Anthony, being put on the spot, accepted the challenge, and that's what the merchant did. So for three days, he starved that poor donkey. And at the end of three days, they put the hay and the oats in one spot, and he went to untether him as St. Anthony brought the Eucharist, as he was proceeding with it. And, of course, once he untethered the burrow, it made a beeline for that hay and oats, and St. Anthony elevated the host and said, Burrow, behold your creator. And it was if that donkey got jerked back because it came up and reared up on its hind legs as if somebody had a rope on it, wheeled around, went toward the Eucharist, and on its forelegs, melt down and bow down in adoration of that Eucharist. And you know that Jewish merchant became a Catholic and believe, of course, in the real presence. You know, the other story I'd like to tell you um, is St. Francis, so well known for his uh, canticle of Brother Sun and Sister Moon and all creatures praising God. And that's in the Psalms, too, that the, all creatures praise their Lord. There's this about wild animals praising the Lord and the tame animals praising the Lord and the whales praising their Lord. But St. Francis was in a town of Gubbio, and they were being under siege by a vicious, vicious wolf, a huge wolf. And it not only ate their livestock, it was killing the people as well as some of the children. And when St. Anthony passed through the town, he saw a couple guys going out with a crossbow, and he asked them where they're going, and they told him, well, we've got to go hunt the great wolf. We haven't been able to kill him. And St. Anthony offered his services. He said, well, I'll go. And they were going to give him the crossbow, but he said, no, no, I, I don't want the crossbow. And he went out onto the edge of town and went where the town started to go into the wood line. And sure enough, the wolf comes out frothing, snapping teeth, and it's big, malevolent look in its eyes. And St. Francis said, Brother Wolf, what you're doing offends God. You can't be killing and eating his men and women. He said, I'm going to tell you what to do. You are going to be peaceful. I'm going to lead you back to town, Brother Wolf, and I will tell the townspeople to take care of you. Well, did you know that wolf bowed its head and walked up to St. Anthony and put his paw in St. Anthony's hand? Sure enough, St. Anthony walks back to the town of Gubbio, and they cannot believe that this wolf is trailing behind him. And he told the people, I have made a deal with the wolf that if you take care of him, feed him, give him water, and treat him well, he will live with you in peace. Well, you know, that wolf, for many years, became like a pet to all the children and the people in the village and was their protector. So much so that when that wolf died, that the town mourned bitterly. And there's a statue of the wolf of Gubbio in that town today. So we see that God uses animals. You know, St. Faustina, and, and this is kind of sad in a little bit way, when we were familiar, if you're familiar, she wrote the Divine Mercy Diary. She had many, many visions of Jesus and wrote down what Jesus told her to say. And this is where our Divine Mercy chaplet came from and the Divine Mercy devotion come from. Extremely powerful, extremely powerful devotion. Uh, Divine Mercy Sunday to Sunday after Easter is just, it's incredible. If you've never experienced it, it's really something in your local parish or to go to Stockbridge to participate in that. Uh, there's great promises made with that devotion. But nonetheless, people with the Divine Mercy, she had visions of heaven and hell. And they tend, we tend to gravitate toward those, those frightening images of hell more. But, you know, she had a vision of heaven. And she saw all creatures worshiping God, that they were happy, and they were singing and praising God together, both the people she saw and the animals. You know, many of the near-death experiences that are reported now, with all the technology we have, there's much more uh, people coming back with stories to tell. And many of them that have had uh, glimpses of heaven have seen animals in there. So 
this is where we, we need to, you know, like I say, step out in faith and have that kind of common sense. But I think it's fairly safe. This is my opinion now. When your child asks you that question, or when an adult asks you that question, will we see animals or pets in heaven? I think you can respond pretty uh, positively with that with a yes. You know, the priests I've talked to, um, they have uh, given me great insight. One of the ones that I've talked to uh, told me that, you know, each pet reflects God's glory. So they reflect God and His glory and, he told me, their personality. And what is good and created, God is not going to throw away. You know, he talks about in Scripture, Jesus, that two sparrows don't fall to the ground without your Father knowing about it. And that's important to remember. All of creation, all of God's creatures, and certainly us, are all under and in the protection of his hands. And he will not lose. This is the key. He will not lose anything that he made. Because God, as we know, is loving, merciful, and forgiving. Even back when Adam and Eve sinned, and they transgressed what, what, what God's commandment was to them, of not eating of that tree, he still took care of Adam and Eve. I mean, they knew they were naked and they were shameful, and he clothed them. Cain kills his brother Abel, and then is worried that he will be killed. But God actually marks Cain so that doesn't happen. And of course, as we know, everything again reconstructed with Noah. So God is always caring for us, always waiting for us to reach out. And this is true of the animal kingdom too. God creates everything. We absolutely believe that. He was... First, before anything, prior to everything, first cause, God created out of nothing. And when we see the beauty of nature, when we see the stars and the sunsets, even the storms, when we see the colors in nature, the flamingos, the stripes on a tiger and a zebra, when we see the spots on a leopard or giraffe, when we see all this color in nature, in the animals, do we actually believe that when we get to heaven, that is going to be taken away? Yet we know there's vegetation in heaven. So it seems illogical that God would save plants and vegetation and the very things that animate us so much here and give us such joy and give us such closeness and happiness would be destroyed. I mean, what, what does God do with, I don't know if you remember this a few years ago, but in Baltimore, there was a little infant, and the mom had just stepped out. She left him up, the infant child upstairs just for a second to go down to the car. The house caught on fire. Her and the neighbors tried to get in to save her baby. They could not. The flames had engulfed too much already. And when the firemen came, they found the dog. I believe the dog's name was Poco or something like that. I don't recall right now. Po Polo, I think it was. Polo, yeah. And the firemen came up, and they found Polo, the little dog, covering the baby with its body. And that baby survived. Unfortunately, Polo died, but the dog survived. Well, do you think our good God would look at that and that animal in that death is just annihilated? You know, remember what Jesus said, no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend. So I would personally have a hard time believing in Jesus seeing that act and just annihilating that animal. To me, that would make no sense. You know, years ago in 1925, the town of Nome in the winter was locked in. It would shut down when the winter ice and the winter storms came. So in essence, they would get all their supplies in the spring and then just have to wait till the next delivery. And a diphtheria epidemic broke out. 
Now, then remember, this town is small. There's Eskimos living on the fringe. There's not a lot of people. There's, you know, children, but not a lot. And diphtheria at that time was a horrible, horrible way to, to go. Literally choked to death until your last, last breath was just a little wheeze, especially affected children. And it spread like, it, would, it could spread like wildfire. Now, at that time, they had some of the antidote but some of it was outdated but they did not have enough nowhere near enough to save the children and the people of that town and remember they were locked out there's no ships coming no anything and at one time they thought aviation was just in its infancy it'd still be a couple years before Lindbergh made his historic flight and they wanted to fly uh, serum in from Washington to save the town of Nome. But because of the storms, they could not do it. And they went by an old standby with a guy named Leonard Seppala and a bunch of heroic men that went out in that blizzard with 40 miles an hour wind at night. And they brought that serum to the town of Nome over miles and miles and miles with dog teams. And the famous one is Balto, who has a statue in Central Park that made the last few miles. But uh, Togo and Seppala, Togo was Seppala's dog, did most of the uh, run. But uh, those guys were amazing. I mean, one guy, they had to literally pry his fingers off the sled when he pulled into the stop to go on the next leg of the run. He was frozen, but he got the serum there. And these dogs were heroic. These dogs were heroic. If uh, you want to read an interesting story, there's a book called The Coolest Miles. It's almost, you'd swear it'd be fiction, but it was fact. But they did save the town. So God here using these animals with his, his men to save fellow men. And I think in, in my heart, I truly believe that God honors that. So we see in Scripture too that the lion will lay down with the lamb. And the leopard will make peace with the ghost. Now, is that, excuse me, with the goat, is that just nice way of talking, uh, an allegory, or is it literal? Is it real? Is there any reason we should not believe that that's true? The danger when we begin to have, you need theological theories, you do. Our, it's a complex world in which we live. And many questions over a period of time through the centuries had to be hammered out. This was what the apostles started through Christ. And it brought up, because Christ is always growing, and since we do too, we have to have that Holy Spirit guide us on the conditions and the changes that mankind through his history experiences. So you need this. It's important. It's important. You can't be just running off all over the place you know, feeling, well, the Spirit told me this, the Spirit told me that, the Spirit did this, Spirit... You can't. That's, that's tricky. That's, that's where, without discernment, proper discernment, you can get into some trouble. But on the other hand, we cannot put God in a box because that means we control Him. When we think we have all the answers, and we don't, and we won't, you can, you can miss, like, like Mr. DeCefano said, you can miss the basic arithmetic for the complex equation, and we don't want to do that. And I encourage so much that when you think of heaven, think large and think playful and think big of God because he created all this, the galaxies, the universes, the, the dogs, the cats, the tigers, me, you, the sky, sun, rain, everything. Everything was created by him. And that is his magnificence. We can't, we can't put that into words. I can't put that into words speaking tonight it's so far beyond us it's on, it's incomprehensible and that's what we want to think of my question here is why wouldn't god making these beautiful creatures he's given us bring them with him rather than annihilation he loves we are told god is love and we are told he said his creation is good and if, as that priest told me, and I believe him 100%, that they reflect his personality and goodness, then we can rest assured that these animals of ours, in my opinion, 
will be with him and with us at the end? And that's a question, like I said, a lot of little kids have, but just adults. I think in, sometimes I'm surprised at some of the, the uh, I don't want to call it anger, but some of the closed-mindedness of some people, that, well, the animals can't be in heaven. Now, there could be many reasons. Maybe they don't like animals. You know, or maybe they think it's a slight at our dignity because we are above the animals. No question about that. No argument there. And maybe there, it, there's a feeling that there's, that's an affront to God, that we're above everything, and by bringing animals into heaven, maybe it sort of it, it, it brings down the expectation of the Creator. But if anything, it should build it up. It should build it up. Because God is free to do what He wants. You know, in Scripture, you have a theme where the younger brothers, like Joseph... And Judah were used, not the firstborn here, okay? They were the youngest. And in that culture, remember, firstborn had all the rights. When you were the last, last or youngest born, you had nothing, really, nothing. And yet God made the precepts and made the covenants with Israel and how this was to be and how things would transpire. But he used, in those two examples I used, Joseph to do such great things at Egypt during the famine, and rise to such a high position, and then reconcile with his brothers, and as we know, his father Jacob lived his last days there. And then, with Judah, that's where every Israel, that's where they made their great gains as a nation. So God can use and do what he wants. And, you know, I had another priest tell me, you get, and I think we've seen this in our lives, most of us, you get slices of heaven here. Newborn child. Beautiful sunset. Something that gives you so much joy, you cry for happiness. Maybe a diagnosis, and then that diagnosis or a cure, a miraculous cure, or maybe just something that was, you were just not expecting that just brought you outside yourself, elevated your soul right to God with such good news. And you get those tastes, those joys that we're going to experience one day. And, if, and for some people it does, for whatever reasons, that the animal kingdom makes a connection with them. And they can't relate to human beings. But they can to an animal. I remember years ago when some of the juvenile delinquent schools, they, they could not, with all the counselors and all the programs they tried, they could not break through these kids. And I remember reading about one, especially a tough young boy, that was just so hard and, and he, he could, they could not get through. And they brought him a puppy. And when they brought the puppy in a room, that boy just exclaimed, Oh, a puppy! And he melted him. And it began to change. Because animals have the capacity to do that. You know, you take some of these dogs. They have an unconditional love that if we could adopt here, we would have heaven on earth. You know, I've seen people hit their dogs. I've seen them mistreat them. It's so unfortunate. I've seen them staked out in yards with just a bowl of food with flies all around, water that's old. You know, those people come home, and I don't mean anything against these people. I don't know why they do it. But that dog will go. It will wag its tail. It will have beaming eyes. My gosh, could you imagine us doing that? If somebody did that to us, most cases, I think if we were staked out with little food or being tortured, we'd want revenge. But they don't do that. They don't do that. So there is a great unconditional love, and I think that's what a lot of people love about animals, especially people that, are, that are, you know, have a little problem in society interacting with people, that the animals can reach them, and they can step outside themselves and to help care for these animals. And the animals bring them joy and peace and important companionship. You know, my former boss used to bring her uh, dog to the rest homes. And I, I did that a couple times, I think, with my dog, Snowcap. And wow, what an effect it has on people. So this 
it's, it's hard for me to picture then that God would annihilate all these beautiful animals that have helped us through time and will continue to help us through time. And I think the question arises, again, here is with the soul. Now, I know St. Thomas the quote. Now, I am not a theologian. And I don't have the brilliance, and I am nowhere in the league of St. Thomas of Aquinas or any of those guys or any of the church fathers or any of the priests that we have out here today. And St. Thomas, when he kind of set the standard here where he said because of his soul, this was the important part, that animals wouldn't get to heaven because they don't have an immortal soul like we do. And that therefore they cannot share in the beatific vision as we do. So our souls are different. And that's true. Because we're created in the image of God. But we also remember that God, when he breathed life into the national atoms, he breathed life into the creatures too. It's important. Breathing is important. God breathes in scripture when the bones are going to be restored to flesh in the Old Testament. He told the prophet to breathe on them, to restore. And then we know And this is very important. When Christ breathes on the apostles and tells them to forgive men their sins and where we get our um, confession practice from. So it's important when God breathes into things and he breathes life into the animals. But they don't have the same soul as we do. So that's one of the problems that, if you will, that we have with animals going to heaven, is if they don't have an immortal soul, how can they behold the face of God? But the flip side of that is we know they have something, some type of spirit, because God created them and breathed that life. And who is to say that God, in his wonderment, his mercy and love, the soul that we have or not, God cannot bring those animals back into heaven, especially if they brought so much joy, this is my opinion now, to people here on earth. And as a son or daughter of their father, and they asked him, will I see my little Ralphie again, Lord? Do you think I can have him? Do you think that God would actually deny he who he came down from heaven to die for? a request that is so simple for him to do? I don't think so. And you know, for the people that don't like animals, you know, probably when you get there, Lord willing, you will. It's not to worry about that. You know, (laughs) it's the old jokes we used to hear about, well, you know, I don't want to be in heaven if such and such is there. Well, if that's true, maybe we won't make it, and I hope that isn't the case. But if such and such is there and we had a problem with him or her on earth and we're both in heaven, well, you know what? We're not going to have any more problem anymore. We're going to love that person as God loves. So for those that don't like animals or afraid of them or whatever the reason, it's a sticking point. In heaven, all this is going to be taken care of. All of it. All of it. And if St. Francis wants to introduce the wolf of Gubbio to you, you're not going to say, no, I don't, I don't have anything to do with it. You're not. You're going to open your arms with love to St. Francis and his pet. Now, I like to think St. Francis is taking care of all our pets, and there's a lot of people up there. You know, personal experience now, um, I had a, an incredible bond with uh, my last dog, Snowcap, was a blue-eyed husky. Uh, went everywhere, in the canoe, up in the mountains, everywhere. We had uh, the, what we used to call, my wife and I had Jesus, the Jesus Club here. It was for the neighborhood kids. We talked about God and the Catholic faith, and we prayed a rosary, taught him a rosary. And the dog would come in there, and I remember when my nephew used to, he was small then, he would stay over, we'd kneel down to do our prayers. My dog, Snowcap, would come right in there and put her nose on the couch where we were kneeling and was right there. So it was really neat. And my dog, and I lived in a pretty tough neighborhood, and as I'd walk around, some of these hardened kids, I saw this myself, boy, when they went to pet and play with Snowcap, they were, they were like so innocent. 
It really was something to see. So my dog brought me, brought me a lot of joy and pleasure. And I, when she got 16, she started having health problems, and I did not, could not, bring her to that vet to euthanize her. I just dreading that. The more I was thinking about it, I said, Lord, and this was my prayer. I said, Lord, just let me wake up in the morning, she's gone, or, you know, that I don't have to go through it. Because I said, I'm not going to be able to do this. I've had her for 16 years, and you know the, ex- the ventures that you blessed us with and all the experiences. Well, you know, my dog collapsed on a Tuesday morning in a place she never went, looking at a picture that I had on up against the TV of the Divine Mercy. And she died in my arms at home. And we were able to bury her, and the neighbors came over because they all knew her. And my friends did, and we had a nice little ceremony. It was really nice. And, um, you know, I wonder. I said, you know, Lord, I don't, uh, I really don't ask you for signs, stuff like that. You bless me with so much, and you you have. But I, I don't, I don't, to ask for this and you know that but I'm going to ask you this time I said because there's this argument and it, it's really bothering me if I you know am I going to see you know not only snowcap but all my pets but am I going to see her am I going to see her in heaven because some people say there's no animals I don't know what to believe for it I said you know so I said people far wiser than me you know say maybe not well that was it so I didn't think much of it now my dog jo- died in July and it was a summer, and, you know, business got, got on as usual. I mean, you have to move on. You have to move on. And it was Christmas time, and we were setting up the house for Christmas, and my wife had bought me a knick-knack of a Samoy dog. So I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. I'll go, uh, I'll go put that out with the other stuff. So I went, and in the bookcase, the year before, she had bought me an ornament. And, you know, we had gotten each other so many presents, and by the time we were done opening, I was too tired to even really care about it, I hate to say. And I looked at this little box, oh, well, thanks, thanks, and put it away. Well, I went in there to the bookcase, and I opened up the box, and I opened up the plastic. And in that box was an ornament of a blue-eyed husky with two wings and a halo on its head. And I just looked at the sacred heart picture I have here in my living room and said, thanks, Lord. So that's a personal experience. There's no theology. There's no, quote, evidence. But it's something in your heart when things, for those that have had experiences or mystical experiences, you know. You know. You know in your heart and soul when you get these gifts from the Lord. So that's a big reason why I believe animals in heaven, but it's certainly not the only one because as we've been talking about on the show tonight, there are many other logical and scriptural reasons for that. And, you know, because of the fall of creation, we know about suffering here among our fellow human beings. All we have to do is turn on the TV or pick up the paper. We see it in our neighborhoods. We see it in our families. But you know, you also see it in the animal kingdom. There's a uh, saying they have, red in tooth and red in claw, which means it's violent. You know, I've spent most of my life, as I mentioned last week, either working or recreating in the outdoors. So I've seen stuff. And you can, it's amazing how peaceful and tranquil things can be. And in an instant, it's violent. It's violent. And animals, well, I don't know if they suffer, Some people, you know, they don't have any, like we know that we're mortal and death will come one day. And that's a heavy, you know, that's a heavy burden on us when you think about it. Because we know that all these these great moments we have in life, in the uh, relationships we share, whether with our fellow man and woman or the animals or whatever it be, we're going to lose it. We we know this. And that, that weighs on us. We may not acknowledge it. You know, the Western civilization tries to run from death, but it's there. The Grim Reaper, as they say, is with his sigh, is always waiting right over our shoulder. But animals, of course, don't have that. Now, so when an animal, say, a predator attacks prey, up until that time, they probably haven't thought too much about it, obviously. But do they know suffering? Some argue they don't. It's just imminent. They don't 
have time for to process everything? I don't know. But some of the stuff is pretty brutal. Um, for those that haven't that had the ability to go out in, in the outdoors, you can see this on even the nature shows that they run. And so animals can. You look at some of the that suffer, and you look at some of the people that do like when they kidnap the dogs and they train them to dog fight. Oh, brutal, brutal stuff. Those animals suffer. They don't want that life, but they're thrown into it by no choice at all. So we have this, because of original sin, all of creation creatures are caught up in this. And my question is, we know and we truly believe as Catholic Christians that God will turn our suffering into joy. We're told that. We're told that. We're told that when we get to heaven, every tear will be wiped away. There will be more, no more crying. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more hurting. There will be no more physical injury. Nothing. And it will be forever. And I tend to believe, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, that animals that suffer, when God sees this, because he knows all things, he's omnipotent, he's all-seeing, all-knowing, I'm sure it chugs at his heartstrings, and he'll make that right too. He'll make that right too. For every time that something bad happens in this world of ours, I think that little thread in the tapestry of heaven is going to be fixed up in, in heaven. I think it's going to be made right, because that's what we seek. You know, in our core, we believe that justice will be done. Why is it that we seek justice? Why in our soul do we seek something better than here? Why do we have this yearning? Even people that are atheists, they, deep down, they know that there's something better. There's something gnawing. They may not acknowledge it as God, and they may fight it and not acknowledge it as God, but there's something there in each one of us. Because St. Augustine told us, we will not be satisfied until we truly rest with him who has made us. That's the whole that Augustine speaks about in our heart. And I think that encompasses Everything that St. Paul talks about when he says all creation groans and travail for its creator because we're waiting to be restored. Isn't our true home heaven? Isn't at the end of time a new earth, a new Jerusalem? And we need to think out of the box, in my opinion, about this, where everything will be restored. Everything. Everything. In ways we can't imagine. In ways we can't imagine. But you know, maybe we should start picturing that now in our lives right here on earth. One, to keep us going. To keep us going when things get tough. That there is going to be that joy. That that suffering is going to be made right. Not just for us, but for everything that knows such travail here on earth we hold on to that belief that's what the resurrection is about it's about a new and glorified life and body it's about finally peace for everyone and everything it's about a love that is inexpressible in our words that our hearts may burst from this it's about being reunited with those that have gone before from time that began to time now to time in the future. That's what our heaven is going to be. And it's going to be fantastic because if we get some clues from Scripture about the jewels and the running water and the fruits you know, some again, to go back to the near-death experience, they've said that there's music that they can't believe everywhere and flowers that have smells that are, they can't describe and colors so vivid, again, they can't describe. That's a lot of things. They know what they've seen and felt and experienced, but they can't put it into human words. It falls far short. That's what we're shooting for. And we need, again, to think big. If you want to think, as Anthony DiStefano in the Travel Guide to Heaven said, that you're going to see the architecture, the Colosseum, the Babylonian gardens, or whatever it was, by all means, think about it. Don't limit your imagination when it comes 
to heaven and it come what comes that brings you joy if anything let it flow let it be larger than life because that's what it's going to be it's going to be larger than life because death no longer has its grasp on us and we'll have that perfect love where we will walk hand in hand with those who are our enemies with those people that maybe we did have something against but it won't be there because if we have to be purged in purgatory by the time we get to heaven we're ready we're ready to accept and have and give that love and it's where the lion will lay down with the lamb and the leopard will make peace with the goat and it'll be paradise like we can't imagine because that's what our Lord began way back in the Garden of Eden and then that idyllic situation was broken but right away God decided he would make it right again God decided he would make it right and that's for you for me our loved ones this creation and his animals because God is generous in what he gives we notice in our lives how much he gives and gives and gives and no matter how much we rebel or how much we turn away God is always willing and ready to welcome us back like the prodigal son with open arms and we can take great comfort in that because no matter how far we stray we can always come back and he'll be there he'll be there always trying to communicate with us always trying to connect so that's a great thing it's a blessing for us and for all because our God is good and he only wants good for us and in heaven it's only going to be good and what makes us happy here on earth we're going to get in heaven to the tenth degree to the hundredth degree to the thousandth degree we just don't know but we should be excited about it now we should live our life here with all the meaning because our lives have purpose here and meaning and when we reach out to our brothers and sisters we're helping bring about the kingdom of God and when we are good stewards of God's environment and his creatures we are also fulfilling our obligations that God wants us to take care of his planet and his creation and that's a good thing it's a good thing because for those that have stepped outside of themselves and have served we know that you get more than you gave and that can be from helping the homeless going to visit the sick feeding the hungry whatever it is we reap the benefits of giving as God did so much at Calvary you know we're going to be winding up Lent and you know it's a nice reflection to think about how much God gave for us how much he wants the best for us and how he's going to restore everything just like he did with the good thief he promised some paradise even at the last moment even when all seemed lost God won the victory and he is not there now we're out we're out of time all right then we'll wrap it up so keep the faith brothers and sisters think high and large about heaven you made quite a case for pets being in heaven certainly here tonight and you know I know a couple that uh, every night before they went to bed they talked about what heaven was going to be like and it changed their whole life yeah so uh, thanks for sharing that Bob because that's what I meant it can keep us going and it'll right. keep us going to the keep on the forefront imagine heaven because that's our week, home next week same time same station with uh, uh, Catholic mysticism with Al Velosky. In the meantime, may God bless each and every one of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thanks, Phil. Bye-bye, Bob. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.